Okay, we're going to move on to our next speaker before break. Last one before break is Dr. Pete Robichaud. He's a research engineer with the Air, Water, and Aquatic Environment Program in Moscow, Idaho. His research focuses on the post-fire environment, specifically erosion mitigation, and works closely with the burned area emergency response teams. And Pete holds a doctorate in agricultural engineering from the University of Idaho. Thank you. This is going to be a great follow-up to that, uh, that, that film we just saw, uh, because I'll be talking about the post-fire environment, some of the things that can happen uh, after the flames are out. So I'm going to focus on that. Uh, first thing I want to do, let's do a click. Let me see what it means. Doesn't change. Let's try that again. All right. Well, with wildfires, um, one of the things is that it really gets into the media quite a bit. It's, uh, it's something that's always shown in, in the local media and national media, et cetera, the impact of that fire on that community, the number of houses burned, et cetera, et cetera. But what's recently happened is we're actually getting people to start thinking about the post-fire environment. And that's something that didn't happen a decade ago. It really wasn't on people's minds as much. But now, after every wildfire, uh, people are starting to think about that and realizing that their community can be at risk, not just for the first year, but multiple years after that fire event. So that's kind of what my research has been focused on, is trying to deal with that. The biz biggest example of that recently was the Thomas Fire debris flow that happened in January of 2018. And that really brought to the limelight of people what can happen after the fires are out. 22 fatalities occurred in that debris flow. And you know it was a combination of people being evacuated for weeks and weeks because of the fire. And then they're told they have to evacuate again because of flooding, because of rainstorms coming. They just really didn't believe that. They couldn't, that can't possibly be that big of an impact. We've had rain before. So a lot of people didn't uh, heed to those warnings and those suggestions to move, and they didn't, and they, that's why we had the fatalities that we had. So I thought I would review what the, um, kind of the burned area emergency response process. This is a process that occurs throughout the country after every large fire, any fire greater than about 500 acres, Regardless of the ownership of the land, whether it's federal or state or even private, we put together teams to assess what the conditions are so that we can plan ahead for the, the potential for flooding, for severe erosion to occur or debris flows to occur. So the first thing that they do, we have to come up with a, a, some way to describe the impact of that fire on the landscape. So we have to come up with a burn severity map. Right now, we use uh, satellite imagery to do that, Landsat or Sentinel imagery, and uh, that will look at the greenness index, basically, of what the fire looked like, what the area looked like before the fire, and what it looks like after the fire. We go out to the field, we validate what that imagery might look like, and we come up with a final soil burn severity map. And just looking at this little image, you can see the amount of red from the initial uh, uh, area that they that the satellite detected versus what the final red looks like on a final soil burn severity map. The next thing they have to do is evaluate uh, values at risk. What's downstream that could be affected by increasing those flood risks? Is it just a road? Is it um, maybe a school? And around here in the west, we tend to build our subdivisions on those alluvial fans because that's the flattest place to build. So now we have a subdivision that could be easily affected by those debris flows or any type of a flooding event that could occur. We have to model these, that, what that response is expected to be like in these burned areas. So I'm going to spend a fair amount of time talking about the modeling work that we've developed to uh, address that. And then if they're going to try to reduce that risk, they have to implement some treatments. And I've done a lot of work on uh, how effective those treatments work and in what conditions do they actually work and what conditions do they not work. So that's really the focus of my talk today, to kind of go through that whole bare process and talk about these things uh, that communities uh, and watershed managers need to know of how to address the impacts of that fire in that longer term. 
So let's talk about that validation of the uh, Landsat image. Uh, we've come up with a, a, a soil burn severity guidebook uh, that you can use to go out there and look at indicators that will tell you something about how that fire has affected things. The, uh, we have five different uh, items that we like to look at. First one is the ground cover, that forest floor, that duff material. Is any of that left after the fire? Did it all get consumed in the fire? Um, that tells us something about uh, the, amount of, uh, the, the amount of consumption that was actually uh, occurred during that fire. The color of the ash and the depth of that ash tells you what the fuel loading was before the fire. The soil structure, was it, were the aggregates all broken down after that fire or are the aggregates still there? What about the fine roots in the upper um, centimeter or half an inch or so of the soil? Are those fine roots still there that help bind and hold that soil in place or have they been consumed? And the other one is uh, soil water repellency. Does everyone know what soil water repellency is after fires? I have a pretty good idea, then I, won't, I don't have to go over that. Uh, but that's another big factor that changes the, the, that watershed response that we're seeing. Okay. Values at risks. How do we evaluate those, those things, those monetary things or non-monetary things? Um, if, it's a, if it's to say, well, okay, this road, uh, this bridge could be damaged by, the, by the, the floods that are going to occur, it took out the embankment in this case, um, we know what it costs to replace that bridge. What about if it's a bull trout habitat? How do you assess a value to protect the bull trout habitat? So we developed a couple of spreadsheet tools that work uh, the way through an economic analysis to be able to put some monetary values to these different things so they can make a more informed decision. What is the change in the risk that I'm going to do by putting in some treatments? And then how is that risk changed into dollars that it's going to cost to actually do that? And what's going to be the net benefit to society? So we have a couple of different tools that are available on our website that walk people through doing those economic assessments. The next thing, uh, landscape response. So this has been a focus of a lot of the work that we've done. Uh, we're using the uh, Water Erosion Prediction Project, um, which is a, a physical-based hydrologic sedimentation model to predict what's going to come down after the fire. I spent my career collecting a lot of the parameters that we use in this model. I've been working with Bill Elliott at uh, our lab, who recently retired on incorporating these into the WEP model to be able to make uh, predictions after the, these fire events occur. Uh, we are pretty happy with the results of this. We've published a couple of papers now on validation of the model results so that it gives the managers a bit more confidence in using these models when they know that, hey, these have been validated with uh, on-the-ground measurements showing how well our model does to these predictions. So we're pretty happy with those results. And the other thing that we've done is that we use the WEP model as our engine, but we've built numerous interfaces for different management questions that come up. And that's been really uh, very uh, useful for people because they want to know a specific question. So I'm going to focus on the interfaces that we're using in the post-fire environment, but we have a variety of interfaces that are shown here. So the, the, uh, the WEP model kind of has two versions, a hill slope uh, component and a watershed component. So in the hill slope component, providing more detail on individual hill slopes, we have two interfaces that we developed, a disturbed WEP interface that deals with timber harvest, thinning, uh, doing prescribed fire, and then we have the ERMIT, which stands for the Erosion Risk Management Tool, which is what we're, the tool that people are using for these post-fire assessments. With all these tools, we've learned that people want to do more than just one hill slope. When you're dealing with a wildfire, you're dealing with uh, hundreds, if not thousands of hill slopes after fire, so we made batch processors so that we, there we can process a lot of uh, different hill slopes at once and make it easier for the user to be able to then sort through and look through those results. At the watershed scale, um, we've worked both within the GIS environment and with 
and outside of the GIS environment, because we've learned that not everyone in the agencies uh, are, are GIS wizards. They're not. Some are and some aren't. Okay? Well, in the people who are GIS wizards, we used to use the ARC environment to, with our models, but every time ARC changed their version, they went from 8.8 .8 to 9.1, well, then our scripts didn't work because they changed the structure of um, how the, the files are saved and, and stored. So then when they changed 9.3 to 9.0, you know, every time they changed, our scripts didn't, didn't work anymore and we'd get a lot of calls saying, hey, it doesn't work anymore. So we went to the QGIS, open source GIS environment because we can hold that version constant and our scripts will work all the time. And then for the non-GIS users, We've gone to the cloud environment, where we've made a rather simple interface that walks users through the information they need to give us to be able to run the model. And that's been very popular. We launched that uh, this spring uh, with some webinars, and it's been very successful thus far. Okay? The other thing that we've done is that we've made it so that when you run the watershed scale, if you want to get to more detailed analysis on hill slopes, you can. We automated the uh, building of the spreadsheet, uh, the inputs that you need to run these different models um, at the hill slope scale. Again, we make it easier for the users to do that. So again, here's our interface page, and I'm going to focus right now on the web cloud products uh, that we've just uh, released this spring to aid in that targeting. Like when I have a large fire, or hundreds of uh, thousands of acres in, in some cases, um, it gives me a good indication of where my hot spots are, and then I can maybe use that hill slope tool, tool to go in and look at mitigation and how will that change my risk for those particular hill slopes. Okay? So this is the interface that we use. Um, it's through um, a, a, a link through the University of Idaho, but everything is run on the cloud. Really helps us uh, during the busy fire season of not bogging down our server. When we had, in the last few years, when we have a lot of uh, bear teams out and they're running our models, our server is just trying to keep up with things, we eliminated that problem by going to the cloud. Okay? So, interesting enough, since that film we just saw is on the, uh, about the uh, watershed work, the um, firewise work in the Flagstaff watershed area, this summer, the 2019 museum fire burned in that demonstration area that we just saw. I didn't know that she was going to give a talk right before me. So just fortuitously, I happened to pick that fire as an example of showing how our tools work. This is the, uh, the soil burn severity map. It's about 5,000 acres just to the northeast of Flagstaff. Okay? So when we run the model, we have a, a script that Topaz that delineates all the channels. We pick an outlet that we're interested in. Um, I'm going to zoom into this one spot down here. I pick a location. It will then go to a, the um, Sorgo and the Statsco database, get the, the soil type for that location. The land use is picking up this soil burn severity map to be able to look at the changes in, let's say, that forest uh, condition after the fire. Uh, we pick a climate that's, that will be gridded to that location. Interesting enough, with our climate, uh, we got asked if we can provide future climate predictions as well. So we made that very easy in a, in a menu system. You can pick a Clygen, a Daymet, uh, which is a, 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 some of our local ob observations, as well as future climates. And we give you a few different choices on which future climate you'd like to try to simulate to, to show the impacts of what the climate change is going to be on these post-fire watershed responses. Okay. When you run the model, we have a various uh, outputs that, uh, out, that, that users can then use to help them make their planning decisions. So in, in this case here, uh, we might have, uh, have, what, 25 inches of precipitation. Here's my hill slope, um, about seven tons and four tons of sediment that would be coming off of, of those hill slopes on an annual basis. Um, we can, we can look at that that way. We can look at the runoff that would be coming off on those particular hill slopes. Uh, we can go to a return period analysis. That's often useful for planning purposes to be able to say, well, if I get a, you know, what's my two-year return interval? So if I want to look at some peak discharges up here, 
I can say, oh yeah, this is a two-year return interval peak discharge, 13 cubic meters per second off of that, that small drainage area that I happen to pick. Uh, it gives me something about rainfall intensities. So, um, you know, a three to four inch per hour, 10 minute rainfall intensity. Um, I can do this in uh, a variety of our different outputs. The idea behind it is we tailored it so that people have different questions. We can provide them some different ways to look at the results that the model did. Okay. We can do it uh, graphically as well, uh, color, color wheels. You can change these colors and have things over here shaded. So we can be over here, what might be what, about nine, nine tons per hectare coming off of that. Again, you can use that for public display purposes, making sure people understand what the actual risks are. Um, they can see which of the hill slopes are the ones that have a higher risk than others. Okay. You can download all this stuff, and as I mentioned, we provide a direct link to the ERMIT models or other models so that the user doesn't even have to do that anymore. We provide the inputs to be able to do more detailed analysis real easy. Okay. So the ERMIT tool, uh, this is kind of a different way to look at uh, watershed response. It's, a, um, it's at the hill slope scale, it's a single storm analysis, and we deal with the event probability. So this is the interface that we use if you're just going to run a, a single hill slope. You pick a climate, you pick a soil, something about the vegetation type and, and the soil burn severity. But we know life out there in the real world is quite variable. There's no such thing as a average annual erosion that's gonna happen after a fire. It's episodic. When an event happens, something's gonna respond. And there's a lot of variability out there. So we don't have that, if you pick a, a, a sandy loam soil that you're gonna have one number of, of infiltration, one number of erodibility. There's a whole variety of numbers that are likely to occur. So we run this in a probabilistic sense. So we run the model hundreds of times in the background, varying the soil parameters that, uh, that we've done measurements are in, in the field. Uh, we change the burn severity, even though it might be cl classified as a high severity, we know that the top of the slope to the bottom, it may not be 100% uniform. There's some variability of how that fire went through. So we incorporate that. We incorporate the variability in the climates and the types of storms that we would be predicting. So we put that all into it so that when you get done, you get a, a probabilistic uh, output. So in this case here, you can just see some of the rainfall events that would occur on the museum fire and most of those happening during the monsoon season. Interesting enough, this summer, they didn't really have a monsoon season. Okay, so the museum fire uh, started on the 9th of, of August uh, and they really haven't had any significant events, rain events, since that time. Our model suggests that they are very ripe to have something happen. There's a 90% chance they're gonna be greater than zero tons per acre off of that, that, that fire area. There's a high likelihood something's gonna happen. The way you look at this, there's a 50% chance, look at that purple line the first year, that's about um, four or five tons per acre are gonna come off of that hill slope. So this provides managers a way to look at that risk, okay? And in this case, there's, there's a high risk that something's gonna happen. Where is the outflow of the drainage if we, uh, from that museum fire? Right into a subdivision. And so when I was there uh, at the end of August, a lot of the houses had sandbags all around their houses, anticipating those flows. But as I mentioned this year, there wasn't any big uh, monsoon event. So I was told that the lo a lot of the people who have, that, uh, have those sandbags are saying, when, is, when are you going to take those away? Because the, the monsoon didn't come this year. Well, it's probably going to come next year, and you're still at risk. And they're like, we have to live with these sandbags till next year? And they're like, well, maybe next year, maybe the year after. So um, big thing for managers to, to convey to the, to the public what the risks really are. Here's the, uh, if we want to look at some different treatments, there's a way to, in our Ermit model to look at the benefits of doing different treatments. So this again, very helpful to the managers to be able to make decisions, let's say, on where they're going to apply a treatment to reduce that risk. Q 
QWeb is that GIS environment. I'm not going to really show you that, but uh, some work with Mary Ellen Miller at Michigan Tech University. It does the exact same thing the other models uh, do, except in a GIS environment. Okay. The last one is treatments. I've done a lot of work on treatment effectiveness over my career. Uh, a variety of hill slope treatments we apply from seeding to agricultural straw to different types of wood product and hydromulch. Um, we've done a lot of evaluation, a lot of publications on that uh, if you have interest in looking about how well these different treatments work. One way to look at it would be how much money have, do we spend on these treatments over the decades and interesting enough up here you can see ag straw has really increased as we found that ground cover any type of cover on the ground is really going to help uh, reduce the impact of that erosion. So if they can uh, apply that with agricultural straw or maybe the uh, wood strand mulches, any type of wood product, uh, that's really going to help. Hydro mulch was used in the beginning of um, like 2000 to 2004. Now not really used very much. Uh, they thought it was going to be a great solution, but it doesn't last very long. It breaks down very, very fast um, within months, six months after they apply it. So unless vegetation grows up really fast, it doesn't buy that much. Not really worth the expense on that. So why are these tools important for the managers? Well, they provide a way to, to model, to predict what's going to happen in that post-fire environment. We provide outputs that can be in a return period analysis. That's something that people are used to thinking of. Uh, so we made sure that our models have that kind of an output to make it easy for them to do that. Uh, spatially explicit. Which hill slopes are the ones that, that they are, are most vulnerable to the erosion? And if they're trying to protect some value at risk, these are the ones that they probably should apply that treatment to. And then to be able to compare different treatments, we provided tools for them to be able to do all that. So the models, uh, they've been getting a lot of use. Um, and we kind of put everything online in 2007. During the big fire season, 2017, 2018, we had over 100,000 model runs of the ERMIT model. Uh, great to see that, a lot of use um, to make very important decisions about treatments, et cetera. Interesting, in the 2019 season, we're way down. We're, we're up like 10,000 model runs, and it's because we didn't have very many fires this year, right? Other than Alaska. So, these tools that we have, they can be used for forest planning as well as for reaction. Uh, we have the ability to tie into some of the uh, fire behavior models so that we can run scenarios, say on a, on a watershed, let's say it's a municipal watershed as an example, we can run different fires through that and then be able to predict how much sediment's gonna come off uh, afterwards. Really useful for them to do some thinning planning projects or maybe if they're thinking of upgrading their water treatment plant to give them a, 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 a good explanation as to why, what the risk is when a fire goes through, and it might be worth their investment to do some of that. The uh, interfaces that we've developed, a lot of different ones to be able to help them address specific uh, research needs, okay? Uh, or, excuse me, specific management needs. Do they want to look at, um, you know, thinning projects? Do they want to be able to compare that over the long term or over the short term? So we've made a lot of different interfaces. By putting our stuff on the cloud, really, really opened up that uh, ability to do multiple things simultaneously and not get bogged down. So we can deal with much larger areas. We can deal with these larger mega fires that before we really had a hard time doing that. So with that, I'll take any questions. Thank you. They definitely had some log decks that had burned. Absolutely correct. And in those spots, it's got pretty hot and toasted for sure. Yeah. But I don't know about the dimensions of it. I didn't measure it, but I certainly saw some. No. Going the way back. Is FS Web able to predict debris flows or is it mostly sheet wash and other 
Yep, good question. Is the FSWEP able to do debris flows? The answer is no at this time. We do not do debris flows. Uh, Dennis Staley with the USGS, they have their uh, probabilistic model of the likelihood of debris flows. Uh, I was just at a meeting with Dennis last week. They're still working on inundation zone. You know, how far out does the de de debris flow go? And to be able to predict that, that is kind of still eluded the, uh, the research so far. But we know that's an important piece. So the model right now does not do debris flows. It's a surface erosion model. But it's a full hydrologic model, though. So we can do the peak flows and runoffs. Any more questions? Right here. So the question is, you know, um, after the fires and the years after the fires, uh, how do we know or what's the single factor that, that reduces that risk of, um, of peak flows and flooding events? And it is that vegetation regrowth, how quickly that occurs and how effective it is. You have to remember that you can't just look on a hill slope, hill slope you know, from the ground, uh, like the bottom of the valley, oh, look at that burn dry. It looks green. It must be recovered by now. Well, no, just because you see some green doesn't mean it's recovered. There's still a lot of bare soil that's exposed. Um, there's still a lot of potential for things to come down. Generally, it takes a few years for those sites to recover that we really reduce our risk. Our, our monitoring efforts have covered things up to five to 10 years after the fire. So we have pretty good recovery rates for a lot of our different ecosystems now. So our modeling effort uh, reflects that. All right, thanks a lot, Pete. Sounds good.